would like to begin by thanking uh, my good friend, Secretary Danny Russell, for a very important um, presentation. Um, the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School, Kishore Mabubani, is currently in Davos. And before he left, he asked whether I could um, chair this, or moderate this Q&A session on his behalf. And I'm very happy to do so. As many of you know, I've spent 21 years of my life in the United States, and I'm an old friend of the United States. Um, <clears throat> since Ambassador Kirk Waga has um, praised you, Danny, I would like to, um, to take a few minutes to praise your boss. Please. <laughs> um, President Obama, um, I, re I recall that in 2008, when you were run running for the presidency, and in the first few years of his uh, presidency, President Obama was the darling of the media. In those times, it would appear as if he could do no wrong. But the pendulum has, in my view, gone too far in the other direction. And you look at the media today, it would seem as if he can do no right. And I think the media has been unfair to him, and I want to change, I want to, uh, change this perception. I want to praise President Obama in the final year of his presidency. <clears throat> I think history will treat him kindly. History will remember that when he came to office in January 2009, the US economy and by extension the world economy was on the brink. It was in danger of going over the brink and precipitating another Great Depression. History will remember that under President Obama's leadership, the US economy has not only not gone over the brink, but has actually recovered from the 2008 recession. That is his first achievement. His second achievement to me is that this is a man of uh, courage. He has been willing to do things which were unpopular with some members of his domestic constituency, and I refer to Iran. It took a lot of courage on his part to seek a peaceful solution to Iran's nuclear ambitions. And he did this in spite of a vicious campaign waged against him by critics both at home and abroad. Another example of his courage, it, it took a lot of courage on his part to end a futile five or six decade long attempt to isolate Cuba and to restore relations with Cuba. So this is a man of courage and I salute him for the courage with which he has um, conducted his presidency. Finally, <clears throat> I salute him because he's made an important, I hope enduring, paradigm shift in, Asia pol in US policy towards Asia. For the f first time, in US history, President Obama has elevated the importance of Asia and the Asia Pacific to the top of the US agenda. I think the rebalancing with Asia policy is, is a paradigm shift. And within that policy, I particularly appreciate the attention he's given to and the priority he's accorded to our region, Southeast Asia, and to ASEAN. I remember, Danny, that in Secretary Clinton's first trip abroad, she came to Asia. Mm -hmm. And during that first trip, she went to Jakarta and visited the ASEAN headquarters. During her four years as Secretary of State, she visited every one of the 10 ASEAN member states. And during President Obama's term, the US has been represented at every meeting of the ASEAN Regional Forum and the East Asia Summit. And he had the courage to accede to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, which his predecessor did not, and thereby enable the United States to join the East Asia Summit. And I thank him very much for hosting a special summit between himself and the 10 ASEAN leaders next month in Sunnylands, California. 
I think the choice of the venue is significant. I don't know whether he intended to send a message or not by the choice of Sunnylands, California. Because we all remember in Southeast Asia that this is the same venue where he hosted a summit meeting with President Xi Jinping. So I want, to, I want Danny Yu to know that, uh, that it doesn't matter what Americans think of him, but many people in Singapore <laughs> and the ASEAN family admire him very much and thank him for his achievements. Good. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, if I could just say, Tommy, one, it does matter what American people think of him. And the fact is that they've elected him twice. <laughs> so uh, there's obviously uh, a strong reservoir of, of support. But I know I'm interrupting you. But on that subject, I appreciate your kind words. I think without putting words in President Obama's mouth, what I learned from working at the White House uh, for the first four and a half years of the Obama administration is this. There's no country that's so rich, strong, or powerful that it can afford not to be smart or that it can afford not to have friends. And that effort to be smart, to uh, focus on what's important, and to work in a way that will garner uh, real friends, uh, friends who share a purpose and will work with us has, I think, been uh, the hallmark of our foreign policy. And thank you, Danny. Um, the most senior representative of the Lee Kuan Yew School is the Vice Dean for Research, Professor Ed Ararao. So I'm giving Ed the privilege of asking the first question. Thank you, Prof. I wasn't prepared to uh, ask the question, but uh, I cannot say no to Prof. Tomiko. And uh, he warned me to say an easy and uh, friendly question being the host. Uh -huh. uh, Ambassador, or, uh, Sec Secretary, thank you very much for your very reassuring and uh, enlightening talk. You mentioned the key word, uh, trust. And you mentioned Iran and North Korea and as a contrast. And uh, so obviously the United States was able to give a credible commitment to Iran. Mm -hmm. What would it take for the United States to make a credible commitment to North Korea, given that their belief is that the United States is after a regime change? Uh, if I may reformulate that a little bit, is the kind of agreement you've negotiated with Iran within the realm of uh, contemplation as far as North Korea is concerned? Well. Trust is not something that falls out of the sky. Trust is something that you build. And uh, trust is built through experience and through uh, delivery of promises made. The United States has the experience of uh, negotiating agreements with uh, North Korea. I myself, in 1993 and four was a member of the U.S. delegation that negotiated the agreed framework uh, with uh, Kang Suk Ju and Kim Gae Gwan, Lee Young Ho, people who remain now major uh, figures in uh, the DPRK. I know them. Uh, I kind of like them. There's no uh, ideology or personal animosity. Uh, that drives U.S. policy towards uh, the DPRK. And we've proven that we can and are willing uh, to make deals. In fact, we've proven again and again that we want to negotiate with North Korea, including through the leap year deal that we made, but that was immediately uh, broken by the DPRK. So the pattern here is uh, one in which North Korea has uh, not honored its commitments, not uh, followed through on its promises, uh, has cheated uh, on, its, uh, on its solemn undertakings. Uh, and that obviously undermines trust. It doesn't build it. The, the fundamental difference, uh, as I see it, uh, between the Iranian and the North Korean approach to the international community's opposition to their 
uh, nuclear programs is that the, Nor the uh, Iranians made a decision to negotiate uh, to see if there was a, a compromise to be had. The North Koreans have made a decision not to negotiate their uh, nuclear program. Uh, we have no problem talking to the North Koreans. We talk to the North Koreans. Uh, we are not pursuing a policy of regime change as evidenced by the fact that the regime hasn't changed. <laughs> we want a peaceful resolution of the nuclear issue. We want North Korea to comply with the UN Security Council resolutions with its international obligations. We want North Korea to honor the agreement that we already reached under the six-party process chaired by the Chinese in 2005 in which they committed to pursue the goal of denuclearization. They committed to denuclearize. And in return, uh, we committed to work uh, as part of that process to normalize relations, to provide economic assistance, and ultimately to negotiate a replacement uh, peace arrangement to the armistice. All of those commitments on our part stand, but they all hinge on one thing, which is North Korea demonstrating that now it is in fact prepared to negotiate a uh, denuclearization agreement and abide by it. Um, thank you for that very positive response. Hi, I'm Nigel Lee, and I go to the Singapore American School. Um, and uh, I've been very active in reading about the recent Taiwanese elections, and you stated yourself that, uh, uh, that it has shown the democratization of Asia. And you said that uh, the United States has invested in furthering ties within um, East Asian countries. So my question um, is, will the United States eventually recognize Taiwan um, as a sovereign state or strengthen ties with Taiwan, uh, why or why not? Thank you. You, you. you know, of course, that you just asked an explosive question. <laughs> I, I, I am aware of that, but which, that's why I'm asking it. Which could be, you're a provocateur, no? You could be a cause. <laughs> this could be a cause for a war, I think. No, I, I hope not. Danny, yeah. Danny, what do, Danny, why don't you uh, take a few minutes to talk about U.S. policy toward Taiwan uh -huh. and toward the new DPP government. Right. The United States has a one China policy. It's built on the three communiques uh, reached between the US and uh, China, the PRC. It's based also on the Taiwan Relations Act. And that means that we have diplomatic relations only with uh, the PRC, but that we have a very healthy, important, full, uh, unofficial relations with uh, Taiwan. Uh, we really value the tremendous strides that uh, Taiwan and uh, the mainland have made in uh, improving cross-strait relations uh, over the last uh, seven or eight years. It's contributed immensely to uh, regional growth and stability. It's removed or at least tamped down a source of great geostrategic uh, uncertainty and threat. It's opened the door not only to us bolstering our economic and our people-to-people -people and practical cooperation with Taiwan, uh, but it's also opened the door to uh, significantly improved bilateral relations between the U.S. and Beijing as well. Now, I know that uh, the Chinese leadership watched the emergence and the rise of the DPP party with great trepidation. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that uh, in a democratic society, it's the people who get to choose. And uh, the uh, voice of the people was heard uh, loudly and clearly in their uh, recent election where uh, Tsai Ing-wen and 
uh, in the legislative yuan, a preponderance of DPP candidates uh, took power. What we've been hearing from uh, Madam Tsai and the uh, DPP is uh, responsible uh, public discussions about uh, stable uh, relations across the strait about uh, maintaining the status quo in a good way, the uh, political foundations uh, the two sides have reached. Uh, this is an immensely sensitive area and it's a place where words matter. And I think both Beijing and um, Madam Tsai and the DPP have chosen their words very carefully. That's important, that's responsible. Now, we think that there is much that uh, China can do to lower the uh, threat, to uh, pull back on the extensive military deployments across the strait that are the source of so much anxiety for the citizens and the voters uh, on Taiwan. Uh, we think that uh, there is much that uh, Taiwan can do uh, to contribute to not only uh, good cross-straits relations, but also regional uh, affairs and the response on the part of Taiwan to natural disasters, their contribution to uh, the f uh, global health security agenda, to climate, to a whole host of challenges nearby and uh, overseas prove that Taiwan has a lot to contribute in terms of the international space. And we hope that, uh, that Beijing will be respectful and uh, supportive of that. Uh, look, ultimately what matters is uh, clear and direct uh, communication across the straits. Uh, the economic progress uh, that they've made is important, but it's not going to proceed any faster than the people on both sides of the Taiwan Straits uh, will support. Uh, in the meantime, though, uh, the U.S. is determined uh, to support and to continue with uh, very friendly, uh, unofficial, but uh, important uh, intercourse with Taiwan, just as we continue to work to uh, build up the U.S.-China relationship. Um, your name is Lino, is it? Nigel. So to, to summarize what um, <laughs> Secretary, 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 Secretary Russell just said, since the United States subscribes to the One China policy, it follows that the United States will not recognize Taiwan as a sovereign and independent state. Yeah. Uh, my name is Patrick Clifford, and I'm also a student at the Singapore American School. Uh, now, first, I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Russell for coming here, and thank you for your speech. And I think um, today, the popular thing to say is that the United States is in decline. And hearing your words, um, it really gives me hope for my country, the United States, um, as we progress in the 21st century. Now, my question is, um, as you stated in your speech, uh, China has continued to make encroachments in Southeast Asia. It's continued to build military infrastructure in islands, such as the Spratly Islands. Um, and now recently, the United States Air Force has flown missions over some of these islands to assert the United States' uh, position in the region. Now, my question is, if China continues to build its military infrastructure in Southeast Asia and the region, um, what more, uh, how, what greater measures is the United States willing to do to protect the national sovereignty of its allies? Um, thank you, thank you. Um, South China Sea, I mm -hmm. think. Huh? Um, Mr. Juma Boy is one of Singapore's most uh, prominent and respected citizens. Um, Amir Ali, congratulations on your 90th birthday. <coughs> I'll, sir, uh, may I say I'm 
truly was impressed by the way you expressed the American diplomatic position with countries in Asia. One cannot discount, of course, the rise of China and with it other countries in the Asian region. So that is a given. But this business of um, South China Sea problems, do you see any way in which this could be solved peacefully? I mean, no one denies the greatness of China. It, it is there and it is the Asian part of growth. So that is my first question. <laughs> the other is, <laughs> I'm, I'm horrified at the number of, uh, the, the type of candidates that are now <laughs> in the United States. Where do these guys come from? <laughs> and I, I think hope, that's a... <laughs> and, I, uh, and I hope it's just a comedy show and they don't uh, turn out <laughs> to be the president. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, think your, I think your second question is too provocative, you know. <laughs> So, so let, let, me, let me put it in a nicer way. <laughs> um, Danny, you said that uh, the Obama policy towards Asia will endure because it is very much in US national interest. I think if, if uh, Hillary Clinton were elected, I'm fairly confident that that would be the case. Would you be equally confident if either Mr. Trump or Senator Cruz were elected? <laughs> so, so the first two questions are about China and South China Sea, mm -hmm. and then the question of will the policy endure into the future, no matter who is elected in November? Mm -hmm. Well, the question of the South China Sea is very much a question about China. And uh, I've heard President Obama in public, but also behind closed doors, uh, say very clearly that we welcome the peaceful rise of China. Uh, the United States isn't afraid of a strong China. We are, however, afraid of a China that is uh, weak and is unstable. That means that we want China to prosper. It means that we want China to have good relations uh, with its neighbors. Uh, but it also means that we want uh, China to operate by the rules. Now, that doesn't mean to suggest that the rules were fixed when uh, the Second World War ended and are immutable. To the contrary, the U.S., whether it's in the WTO or G20 or elsewhere, has worked to ensure that there's a seat at the table for China. But there's a bargain here, which is that if you're going to have a voice in reshaping and modernizing the global system for the 21st century, then you have to accept that those rules and those norms apply to you as well. That's one of the things that I'm proud of in my country, that uh, even though we could have gotten our way by uh, strength over the decades, with a few exceptions, uh, we accepted the limits uh, that international law and norms uh, put on us. And so the issue in the South China Sea, as I said in my, my remarks, uh, is very much about the question of whether China's rise will contribute to the stability and the prosperity of the region and the globe, whether China can rise in a manner that is conducive to the kind of world that we all want to live in. We have a, a big stake in China's success in that respect. So the behavior that we see in the South China Sea is worrying and distressing to us. We use our direct diplomatic engagement with China uh, to lay out our views, our concerns, offer our advice, and frankly to make clear 
uh, to China what the uh, downstream consequences of that problematic behavior is. I don't mean in the sense of a threat. We're not in the threat business. But let's face it. The laws of physics apply. Every reaction has an equal and opposite reaction. And the alarm and the fear that is generated by coercive and threatening behavior by a major power generates a counter response. It generates uh, not merely resentment, but a, a hedging strategy, a determination uh, to seek justice. And that plays out in practical ways through an increased demand signal for American military presence in the Asia Pacific region. So the unintended effect of uh, the behavior that China is exhibiting in the South China Sea is to create a network of countries that are linking themselves in security relationships with the United States and creating the very dynamic that you would expect China's leaders are seeking to avoid. We're not containing China, but China is creating an environment in which the neighborhood is banding together uh, to protect themselves in a way that resembles the very thing that China uh, appears to fear. Now, we work to shine a spotlight on problematic behavior. It's very important, I think, for China's leaders to hear what, in an authoritarian system, perhaps uh, Chinese diplomats don't have a big incentive to pass up through the system, namely that uh, the strategy is not working, namely that uh, the relationship between China and its neighbors is being badly undermined by this relentless pursuit of advantage. Uh, we want to promote a uh, common understanding of how countries interact in the global commons in the 21st century. Uh, and it's very important to us that, and I think very possible uh, for China to uh, find a, a way forward that is uh, not contrary to its uh, sovereignty claims and not inimical to its own security interests, but that is respectful uh, of the rights and the concerns of its neighbors, particularly in such a sensitive area as the South China Sea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've been asked to conclude the session at 6.30. So it's almost 6.30. If there's a woman in the house, I will give her the floor. <laughs> yes, there's a woman in the house, so you have the floor. This will be the last question. Thanks. I'm Angela Mancini with Control Risks. I was going to ask the Donald Trump question, but somebody beat me to that. I wanted to ask you about the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIB. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get your views on what is the administration's view on how that might evolve here and to what extent might that impact U.S. interest in the region? And do you think there might be a time where the U.S. would seek to somehow become actually involved in it? Thank you. Great question. Yeah, good question. So I, I put it, I, I, I piggyback on this question and ask, one of my hopes is that one day the U.S. will join the AIIB and China will join the TPP. <laughs> 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 so help, help me to fulfill my wish, Danny. <laughs> Well, I've, I've said to my colleague, Mike Froman, more than once, uh, and I know he agrees, that the world would be a better place if China were able to meet the st high standards uh, of the TPP and be able to join. With respect to the AIIB, uh, I would say similarly that the world will be a better place if uh, the AIIB operates in a way that is uh, consistent with the high standards that international development banks have painstakingly achieved over the decades. The U.S. is very, very heavily invested in uh, the World Bank and in the Asia Development Bank 
Uh, we're not uh, looking for, nor I think is it likely that we're going to get uh, a couple of dozen billion dollars out of Congress anytime soon uh, to invest in the AIIB. Uh, and we completely agree with the view that the region is in uh, dire need of significant investment in infrastructure. Uh, now, our specialty is uh, heavier on the software side. Uh, uh, we're not uh, the region's biggest uh, manu you know, producer of iron or construction materials, concrete, and laborers. Uh, we do have a lot to offer in terms of infrastructure, and we have a lot to offer in terms of development financing. One, one of the things that we care about is that development uh, financing and infrastructure investment be conducted in a way that is uh, sustainable, that's consistent with good environmental practices, that's responsible. An initial concern that we had, uh, particularly when the Chinese began their uh, abrupt announcement about uh, a creation of an AIB, is the fact that the world already has uh, these development banks, and that uh, the development banks have over time uh, acquired uh, operating principles and standards uh, that represent uh, important lessons learned. At the beginning, the message the Chinese sent on the AIB was, all will be revealed, there's a lot of money here, sign on the dotted line, details will follow. That alarmed us, and we frankly weren't having any of it. Over the months that followed, based on consultations with other uh, countries and with the Chinese, uh, I think that we were able to help encourage an evolution in the thinking and in the design of the AIIB, such that now uh, the Chinese say that their intention is that their initial projects will be uh, co-funded in many cases with the Asian Development Bank. So creating an AIIB uh, that's transparent, contributing to global efforts in ways that are respectful of the existing institutions and the work that has gone before. Operating in the international environment, uh, not in a uh, unilateral way, but in a consultative way, uh, that's the kind of behavior that we want, I think we all want, to see from China. This has been a big learning experience. Uh, for China. Now, the bank hasn't started operating yet. Uh, there are uh, some pretty big challenges ahead for uh, China, but we are supportive of the effort. We uh, recognize the significant improvements in the design and transparency, uh, in the uh, standards and in the principles now, hopefully, the operation of the bank itself will be true to those principles. There are other areas like creating an independent, uh, non-resident board, uh, ensuring the environmental uh, viability and quality of, of the deals, uh, making sure that the projects that the bank funds are actually projects that support uh, infrastructure development throughout the region and then are not merely uh, Chinese uh, employment mechanisms or not merely uh, ways of uh, exporting excess uh, manufacturing and labor capacity. Um, but I think the trend lines are moving in a positive direction and I, I'm hopeful that AIB will be a, uh, in the future, a real contributor to the region's growth. Secretary uh, Russell has gone to another engagement. He arrived at 2 a.m. this morning and has <laughs> been on the go all day, so I think we should let him go.
Um, thank you all very much for coming. Please join me in giving you a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.